Welcome to the MD's Fantasy Football Show. Now for your host, Dan Mater. And welcome back to the show, MD Nation. As always, I'm your host, Dan Mater. Very excited to be with you on this Monday again to get your day started, to get your new week started, the new Monday started, because we are now only a week and a half away from August. And you know what that means. When August first kicks off, we have full swing into fantasy football draft season. It is great. It is my favorite time of the year. It is my Christmas the entire month of August because it is fantasy draft time. It is the moment we've been prepping for, the moment we've been researching for, the moment where we take our first major steps into becoming a championship team. That is what it is all about. That is what I'm here for. I live to serve you guys to help you become fantasy champions, and that's why we are here on this show. And in a week and a half, about that amount of time, that first week of August, the first projections and rankings for the MD's Fantasy Football Show will be made available to you on the website, mdffshow.com. Soon thereafter, we will have the downloadable draft kit, complete draft kit made available to you to give you all the guide guidance that you need in order to win your drafts and take your first big steps towards winning your championship. Remember, we're going to have depth charts. We're going to have schedules. We're going to have projections. We're going to have rankings. We're going to have tier rankings. All those things in one nice package for you to be able to take with you to your drafts or if you're drafting from home, be able to sit there and look at through for you that will give you all the guidance you need in order to win your drafts. Now, remember, if you want to keep up to date on when that will be dropping or when a new episode is going to be dropping or when you have player update news notifications, which are completely free as long as you follow me on Twitter at MDFF show and hit the little bell for your notifications to make sure you are getting everything that this show is producing, especially on social media. That is how you can keep up with all the updates, all the new information. We've had a lot of player news update information come out the past couple of weeks. Really important stuff. If you're in dynasty leagues, it's information you need to know now. If you're going to be drafting that first week of August, it's information you need to know now. There's no reason not to subscribe. It's completely free because you're following me on Twitter and it will go throughout the entire season 24 7 of course always make sure you're following me of course on Facebook as well at MDFF show there too before we get into today's episode which we'll be talking about the fifth installment of the fantasy analysis by team depth charts mini series continuing on today and yes I did get you a very special guest who's going to be coming on in our last segment of the show talking about the Indianapolis Colts because that is what I try to do for you guys. You're going to want to listen to this entire show all the way through. It's going to be great content. There's nothing you're going to want to miss. You're going to want to know it all. So make sure you listen throughout the entire show. Before we get into that part, though, we actually have a latest news segment that we are going to have to talk about. Because once again, we had news that broke that we can't we can't ignore. We have to acknowledge. So what we have going on before we get into this content is, you should know this by now, I would think, but in case you have it, Tyreek Hill is no longer going to be suspended for any amount of time in the 2019 season. He's going to be available from week one. He's going to be practicing with the team. The Chiefs are not going to discipline him in any kind of way. How you feel about that is how you feel about that. This show is a fantasy football show, and that's where I try to keep the perspective of this show on. I'm not here to be a moral compass. I'm not here to comment on what should be right and what should be wrong. At the end of the day, clearly the NFL and the Justice Department did not feel as though they had enough evidence to charge or suspend Tyreek Hill. Do with that as you may. But from a fantasy perspective, which is what this show is going to try to keep on and and give you the best advice possible, is that, guess what? Tyreek Hill's a wide receiver one. Tyreek Hill belongs in the second round. And he does a few different things. Obviously, this is great news for Tyreek Hill. But it's not just great news for him. This is great news for Patrick Mahomes. This is great news, believe it or not, for Travis Kelsey because now defenses won't be able to just single him out when they're game planning for the Chiefs. 
This is great news for Damian Williams because it goes a long way in keeping guys out of the box. The only person that this really affects in a negative way is Sammy Watkins. Sammy Watkins is dropping, and I did a few mock drafts since the news of Tyreek Hill has come out to try to get an idea as to where he's falling in most platforms amongst fans at the moment. This is a guy who was getting drafted around the 5th, 6th round in the territory of an Allen Robinson, a Tyler Lockett, a Mike Williams, somewhere in the vicinity of there, and he fell consistently to me in the ninth round, and I think he might have even fallen further. All the mock drafts, I wind up drafting him in the ninth round personally to take him off the board then. So I am curious to see if maybe he would have been around in the tenth round had I not done that. But the reason why I did that is because Sammy Watkins in the ninth round is a great value. This is still a guy who's going to have games for you where he's going to have big weeks. He's still going to be a high-end wide receiver three with wide receiver two potential. He has a ton of talent. So let's not go completely sleeping on Sammy Watkins. Yes, he's going to be injury prone, but now because his ADP is dropping like a rock because of the Tyreek Hill news, and he's going to keep continue to drop to the ninth round, I'm telling you right now, he's a steal there. So I just wanted to point that out for as far as, far as the Tyreek Hill stuff goes. So you have nothing to worry about. Back to the drawing board. It gives Patrick Mahomes a boost. I haven't seen Patrick Mahomes move up yet. But we probably will see that as we get closer. It's only been a few days. I have seen Damian Williams take a major jump up. I think partially is because of the Tyree Kill news. Partially is because of what we talked about last Thursday when I talked about the Chiefs and Andy Reid coming out and saying that Damian Williams has earned the right to at least start off the season as a starter. What that means, we still don't really know, but it does sound like it was a vote of confidence from the coach saying that he's not just going to be a starter, but the guy who's going to get the opportunity to have the majority of the work at least at the beginning of the season. So he's jumped up. So I'm just trying to give you some ideas as to what this Tyreek Hill news has done for the other surrounding Kansas City Chiefs players and their fantasy outlooks, given that that was a team that we talked about in the last episode. The second piece of news that we have to talk about and mention today is Ezekiel Elliott. From what I understand, from sources with close to the situation, are saying that they have ex- they are expecting that Ezekiel Elliott is planning a vacation, but not just a vacation, a vacation out of the country for this week instead of reporting to training camp. When this and this is going to be the week of training camps starting, especially for Dallas. So instead of reporting, supposedly he's planning a trip out of the country. So the private conversation that leaked to the media about him saying privately to people around him that he may hold out in hopes for a new contract from the Cowboys seems to be cemented with that news that he's going to not only is going to hold out but he's not even going to be around for the holdout making it clear that he is not even going to be tempted to come back to camp until he decides he is or until the Cowboys give him a new contract so now we have Melvin Gordon and Ezekiel Elliott in fierce holdouts for new contracts heading into training camp. So those are going to be stories we're going to have to watch. All right, on the other side here, we're talking the Chargers. We're going to be talking the Bengals. We're going to be talking the Seahawks along with the Colts in the last segment. So we're going to get into this episode. we got a lot to talk about. We'll take a break right here, come back, talk about the Los Angeles Chargers. Tired of spending hours upon hours on research for your drafts but still want the excitement of having something on the line while watching the game? Well, join the Thrive Fantasy app where they have streamlined the process for you to make it easy and fun to play along. Use promo code MDFF when you sign up with a $10 deposit and receive an additional $10 for free. Again, that's promo code MDFF. So we got to mention Melvin Gordon a little bit here when we're talking about Ezekiel Elliott and how they're going to be the two big backs that are going to be holding out. And that is the biggest thing to talk about when looking at the potential fantasy outlook of the Los Angeles Chargers. Look, at the end of the day, Melvin Gordon is probably the closest thing to a Todd Gurley type of running back when he's healthy as there is out there. He's a similar build. He's a similar type of runner. He gets into a workhorse role. He catches the ball. He does everything. Austin Eckler's a little bit more involved than anybody else is on the Rams side up until this point. We'll see what happens this season for Todd Gurley. But this is a guy who's a superstar for fantasy purposes. 
He's an injury-prone superstar, though, and that's the issue. And that's where I have concerns about a guy like that who's going to potentially miss a good chunk of camp. Now, does Melvin Gordon need training camp to be ready for the game week one? No, he doesn't need to be ready for the game week one to play at a high level. What I'm more worried about is I want in I want him in there working out, keeping his body in his best physical shape as possible to hopefully avoid injury. There'd be nice if it was just one season where Melvin Gordon could actually play all 16 games without you knowing that he's going to miss two to three games, maybe four. Like you know, you know you're gonna probably get two to three games missed out of Melvin Gordon each season. It's just a question of when is he going to miss? And last year, he missed at one of the most inopportune times. He missed right before the fantasy playoffs. That's where the risk comes in with a guy like Melvin Gordon. He's going to be an RB1 for you if he's on the field and playing. We all know this. Not just is he going to be an RB1, but he's going to be a top six running back. Period. For fantasy football purposes. That's why he's still a guy who's going in the first round even now with the threat of the holdout. I just want him in there from that kind of perspective. From being able to keep your body in as conditioned as possible. Yes, these guys work out even when they're not near the teams, but it's not the same. It's not the same wear and tear. When you work out, you're lifting weights, you're doing agility drills, you're trying to get your muscles stronger, but what your muscles really need is to get used to getting hit again. These guys don't play in the preseason, but they do get hit in training camp. They get hit on 11 and 11s. They get used to going back into the football shape, doing football things. That is the best thing that he could possibly do to help him try to stay healthy at some point. So it does concern me a little bit that Melvin Gordon could be holding out. And as far as, you know, when you compare him and the Ezekiel Elliott situation, it does seem like Melvin Gordon has drawn his line to stand a little bit harder than Elliott has, or at the very least, more publicly. But we know what Melvin Gordon is going to be. Now, what is my take on it as of now? As of now, I would say I am leaning over 50% that Melvin Gordon will be signed and playing week one for the Chargers. That is the way I'm leaning. It's also the week before August. It's also July 22nd when you are listening to this episode. So it's early. They're going to lock it develop. We could hear from the Chargers camp that they're not willing to deal or they're not willing to get close to the number that he is. And perhaps his threat of demanding a trade if he doesn't get a new contract is something that he's willing to stick to. The reason I say he, I lean more towards him playing this season one way or another, whether it's the Chargers signing him or whether him, it's just him ending his holdout, and not being a Le'Veon Bell situation where he just sits out the entire year. Or the fact that he gets traded, because I don't think that'll happen either. It's because, look, the Chargers are a really good team at the end of the day. This is a legitimate Super Bowl contending team this season when you look at the talent that they have on both sides of the ball. So it's hard for me to believe that Melvin Gordon would just so easily walk away from that. Now, right now, his leverage is now. He knows he doesn't necessarily need training camp to be a starter and to play at a high level. He saw what Le'Veon Bell just did and was able to pull off with the New York Jets, getting his contract one way or another after not playing for an entire year of football. So right now, he has all the leverage he's ever going to have to try to get this new deal done. So this is why this is the time to do it. But at the end of the day, I have to lean towards he will be on the field week one with or without a new contract and with the Los Angeles Chargers. Now, if he doesn't, if he does get traded, or if he is going to hold out until he gets a new contract and they don't pony up, and he does hold out into the season, well then, hello Justin Jackson. Hello Austin Eckler. The good news is with the Chargers, we've kind of already seen this play out. They didn't go out and get anybody new. They kept their guys from a year ago. So we 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 know what to expect pretty easily in this situation If Melvin Gordon doesn't play, it's the same situation what happened last year when he got hurt. Justin Jackson comes in. He's the primary runner. He's the first and second down guy. He's the guy who's going to get those 15 to 20 carries in the game because the Chargers do like to run the ball a healthy bit with Anthony Lynn. That's what he likes to do. He likes to have a balanced attack. Austin Eckler is going to come in on passing downs, two-minute drills, no huddles, third downs, catch-up mode, whatever the case may be. If, there's passing, if it's an obvious passing down work to be had, Austin Eckler's going to be in the game, which makes him very valuable for PPR. Even with Melvin Gordon, he has some value as PPR. Not quite as much as people try to make him out to be. He's not a flex play every week if Melvin Gordon's on the field, but he has some value. So we know how this breaks down if Melvin Gordon can't go. 
So that's the good news. Quarterback situation kind of skipped over a little bit because there's not really a lot to talk about. We know what Phil Rivers is. We know he can be a good quarterback as long as he has good weapons. We know he can put up some decent touchdown numbers as long as he has a good tight end. He has those things this year. With or without Melvin Gordon, he's going to have weapons to throw the ball to. He's going to have Keenan Allen. He's going to have Mike Williams. He's still going to have Travis Benjamin, who I think gets overlooked as a weapon that Phillip Rivers has and that the Chargers offense has that makes everything a lot easier when you have a speedster like that to stretch the field, when you have possession receivers like Keenan Allen and Mike Williams doing the receiver tree. He's going to have Hunter Henry back, which is going to be huge. And uh, let me talk about Hunter Henry first. I mean, we were talking about the Chargers. I was going to wait a little bit, but let's talk about Hunter Henry for a second because we got to get this off my mind. Last year, there was people who were picking up Hunter Henry in the middle of the season with the thought that he might, on the off chance, might come back in December for the fantasy playoffs. An injury that we all knew was supposed to keep him out for the entire year. And because there was a slimmer of hope because the Chargers were talking about possibly seeing if maybe he can come back in December in case they're going to go on a playoff run, people were actually picking him up off of waiver wires and stashing him on their teams in case that happened because the tight end position was one so putrid, but because they also knew what Hunter Henry and the Chargers offense could bring to the table. Fast forward a year. Maybe it's because his ADP is in the 6th, 7th round. 8th round as well, depending on what size league you're in. Maybe, maybe, Maybe people feel like that's a bit high. I think that's exactly where he belongs. With that, with that tier of tight ends, and that's usually where they go. But maybe some people feel it's a bit high. But all of a sudden, a year later, people are talking about Hunter Henry like, well, he can't stay healthy. How can you trust a guy like Hunter Henry? I don't want to take this guy. And I'm just looking at like, where were you guys the year before when you were stashing him in a, in, a, in a year where he wasn't supposed to play at all in the hopes that you might have him for a fantasy playoff run at the tight end position? Where were you guys then? Now all of a sudden, it's well, he can't stay healthy. He's not worth the draft pick. He's not worth taking that high. I want to take him rather as a sleeper. I'd rather take Eric Ebron. I'd rather take, you know, uh, who else is going in us? We got Eric. We got well, we got Eric, we got Eric Ebron. We have O.J. Howard, who belongs there, also going in that range. Evan Ingram, who also belongs there. But let's take Evan Ingram. I think Hunter Henry has more upside than Evan Ingram does because he's going to be on a better offense. Will Ingram get more of the share of the targets on his team compared to Hunter Henry? Yeah. Hunter Henry's going to have more touchdowns. I can tell you that right now because he's going to be offense is going to be able to score more and he's going to be utilized in the red zone because that's what Phillip Rivers does. He utilizes tight ends. Hunter Henry's a very good player. So I just want to comment on that I've noticed going into the season that all of a sudden Hunter Henry went from somebody that everyone needed a piece of even though he truly wasn't ready to now fast forward a year where he is healthy from the injury it's been a year and a half he's been able to recover he should be 100% ready to go and all of a sudden it's like well he's a big risk because he can't stay healthy it was one injury it was a bad injury obviously took a year and a half to recover but it was one injury I don't know how all of a sudden that just makes this guy injury prone no matter what going into the season. Are you concerned coming off of the knee? Yeah. But he's a tight end. He doesn't have to get the round the ground and pound like the running backs do. He doesn't have to be as explosive or run as many routes in the receiver tree as the receivers do. He's a good tight end with good speed who's still young, 100% healthy with Phillip Rivers as his quarterback. Hunter Henry is definitely somebody you're going to want on your team. He's not somebody you're going to want to shy from, and he's going exactly where he belongs. Amongst the O.J. Howards, the Evan Ingrams, the Eric Ebrons, he should be well ahead of Eric Ebron. You want to make an argument, Evan Ingram, fine, but that's exactly where he should be going. So I just wanted to get that comment out there right away as we were talking about the Chargers because that's something that's been driving me crazy that I've noticed for the past couple of weeks. As far as the receivers go, we know what we have. Keenan Allen is number one. Mike Williams is number two. Now, I think the only question mark that people really have is with Mike Williams, what to expect out of him. Now that Tyrell Williams is gone, he's not going to have to split reps as that wide receiver two. It narrows down who Phillip Rivers is going to throw the ball to because outside of Keenan Allen last year, he really did spread it out quite a bit. Mike Williams had double-digit touchdowns but was on a very low work share. 
I think there's a chance Mike Williams could have more of a work share, but not quite get double the touchdowns and wind up with nine. I'm not saying that's what I'm projecting. I haven't gotten there yet. And I will let you know in a couple of weeks. But what I'm saying is that Mike Williams is going to be more involved in this offense on a consistent basis. He's going to be a red zone target. But I guess I want to lay the groundwork that if he doesn't get 10 touchdowns and gets 8 or 9 instead, that's not something going to make him a bust for this season because there's a really good chance that he approaches 1,000 yards, at least gets 900, which is going to make him, giving me 900 yards, 8 to 9 touchdowns, you're giving me a solid wide receiver too. And that would be his floor. So this is an offense where he's going to get more share. He's going to get all these red zone looks. It's going to be him and Hunter Henry in the red zone as far as receiving game goes. It's going to be fine. A lot of people like him a lot to take a big step up this year. I do too. I'm just pointing out what his floor is. 900 yards, 8-9 to nine touchdowns. That would be a good floor for Mike Williams this season. So he's a wide receiver too. I believe with high-end wide receiver two, and he'll have a couple of weeks here and there where he might get you wide receiver one numbers, get you like a two-touchdown type of game, very possible as well. Mike Williams is definitely, he's going hes going where he belongs right now. He's going in that like fifth, sixth round. I've talked about this before amongst Tyler Lockett, a little bit ahead of Alshon Jeffrey, right around Allen Robinson. That's about where he should be going because he's going to score touchdowns like those guys are. Well, Alshon Jeffrey and Allen Robinson and even Tyler Lockett has, has to what it seems is going to be the number one targets within their offense because the Chargers will be a very good offense because Mike Williams is such a red zone threat. He does belong right with those guys because he could wind up having similar numbers to them because that's how good he is. Keenan Allen, we know what Keenan Allen is. Keenan Allen is a great PPR wide receiver, a very good standard wide receiver, Who's going in about the third round right now and will probably finish in the bottom tier of the wide receiver ones? That's what Keenan Allen is, as long as he stays healthy. And he was able to stay healthy last year. I think he's, you know, quieted down some concerns that people have had with him over the years about him being able to stay healthy. He did a pretty good job last year. Seems got over the hump a little bit. So you can go in this year with a little more confidence that if you take Keenan Allen, you're going to get a guy who's going to be in the bottom tier of the wide receiver ones. And, and feel good about that, no matter what scoring league you're in. Chargers defense are one of my favorite defenses. Look, they were a pretty decent defense last year, and Casey Hayward got hurt. Jason Verrett, who's not on the team this year anymore anyway, but he also got hurt early on. Joey Bosa was out for most of the year. Joey Bosa's healthy now. He's going to be paired up with Ingram as the pass rush. Casey Hayward's healthy. This defense should be really good. Should be really good. So they're def- to me, they're definitely in the running to being a top five fantasy defense. The potential is definitely there. They're definitely a defense you're going to want to draft at the rounds that you typically look for defenses, whether that be the 14th, the 15th, or the 16th round. But they are a defense that you are going to want to try to draft if you get the opportunity to do so. They're going to be great for sacks and great for turnovers and great for fantasy purposes. Kicker, Mike Bagley, he might finally be the one who breaks the Chargers' curse of losing all of these close games in the fourth quarter because they can't get a kicker to come through in the clutch. This guy's really good. He's got a great leg. I think he will be just fine. I think he will squash a lot of the issues the Chargers have had late in games throughout the past couple of years, which is why I say I do think they are a legitimate Super Bowl contender, which goes back to my Melvin Gordon point. There's a lot of fantasy value to be had. I'll I'll look, Philip Rivers, I don't have him as quite as a quarterback one. Is he a streamer? Yeah. Is he a guy who, if I'm taking maybe a Jameis Winston or a Lamar Jackson as my first quarterback, that maybe I would draft anyway to have a second quarterback to rotate from the get-go? Yeah, he's that guy too. Melvin Gordon's a stud. Austin Eckler, Justin Jackson have a ton of value if he does hold out into the season. Keenan Allen, Mike Williams are going to be wide receiver ones, wide receiver twos throughout the whole year. Hunter Henry is going to be a tight end one. There's a lot of fantasy value to be had on the Chargers this season. And what's crazy about them is they're all pretty much going where they should go, which is rare. We're going to take a quick break here. We're going to come back on the other side. We're going to talk about Cincinnati Bengals. 
The MD's Fantasy Football Show is now partnered with the Unwrapped Sports Network. Unwrapped Sports Network has a top-notch sports blog covering all sports all the time with a team of talented writers. You can also visit their podcast page to listen to this show and several others covering multiple sports. Sign up for their newsletter and never miss a thing at UnwrappedSports.com. Again, that's UnwrappedSports.com. The Cincinnati Bengals are a team that I've gotten the opportunity to be able to talk about during the Coaching Changes Fantasy Impacts series, which if you haven't listened to, please go back and listen to that as well on your favorite pod app, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Radio Public. Go back to the website, mdffshow.com, to listen to all those previous episodes because they're all very important heading into the season. But they've been one of my favorite teams to talk about because they're one of the few teams that made a head coaching decision that I think is really going to pay dividends for their entire roster as far as their fantasy outlook goes for 2019. Because this is one of the few teams where the coaching philosophy and the coaching scheme that you know he wants to run coming in in Zach Taylor actually fits all, not not just some, not a couple, not one, but fits all of the personnel that's already in place on the offense in a perfect way. Andy Dalton is the perfect type of quarterback to be a levels read quarterback. And what I mean is same things that Jared Goff does. He reads top, middle, bottom, or deep, intermediate, short, however you want to look at it. But that's how how they run their offense. They run it in three levels. Andy Dalton, that fits him perfectly. Not not man-on-man, zone coverage, cover. No, no, no. Read it by the levels. Break the reads down for yourself. And I think it's going to help Andy Dalton because he also has the weapons to be able to back it up. A.J. Green is the perfect Robert Woods type because he can run all the receiver trees that he doesn't get as much credit for as he should because he's a hell of a route runner. Plus, he has the explosive factor on top of it. And you can mix them all around the field. You can put them in the slot. You can put them in the outside. It doesn't matter. You can throw them all over the place. Tyler Boyd is the perfect Cooper Cup comp. I can't think of another guy outside of Tyler Boyd who can fit what Cooper Cup does as a slot receiver with his physical attributes than Tyler Boyd can. He fits that perfectly. He's going to fit. He's going to be able to do exactly what he's asked of. And John Ross, look, I don't think John Ross is a great receiver at the end of the day. I thought he was a bust when they drafted him in the first round years ago. But he'll fill the Brandon Cooks role well. He's not nearly as good as Brandon Cooks. He won't be the lead receiver as a result. But he is the guy who can run a few jet sweeps, who can run a few bubble screens, who can go deep. Those are the three things he can do. Those are the three things he's going to be asked to do in that offense. So he fits that well too. All their tight ends got hurt. Okay, the Rams don't use the tight end really that much anyway. I don't expect the Cincinnati Bengals to do either. Eifert's back. We'll see how long he's able to stay healthy. He'll be a red zone option if he can stay healthy, but at this point, I don't really know what he has left because I don't know how great a shape you can be in if you're constantly worried about your back going out at any given moment. We know backing him up is C.J. Uzuma. Competent tight end. No different to me than a Tyler Higby or a Gerald Everett, where they're guys that you're not really going to be looking to play in a fantasy situation. They'll have games where they'll have relevance, but you're never going to know when that game's going to be, so you might as well not even bother. The big thing to me, the number one thing to me about this offense and why it fits the Rams so well is Joe Mixon. Because Joe Mixon is, I don't want to say the same running back as Gurley, but has similar physical abilities. Where he's a bigger back, but catches the ball really well, and is really nimble, and has great balance, and is able to break the tackles, and just a superstar in the making. I guess one of the big key differences to what the Bengals probably will not be able to do quite as well with the Rams is that their offensive line is not on the level. I like Billy Price, their center. Outside of Billy Price, I'm a little unsure about the rest of that offensive line and what they're going to be able to do. They just had a guy retire on them. They just had to cut a guy. So, you know, 
we'll see what they're able to put together in the offensive line around Billy Price. I like their center, and the center's a good place to start. Look look what Alex Mack was able to do for the past couple of years on the Falcons before they just went this offseason and got themselves good talent to surround him. He, him by himself, was able to at least make that offensive line competent enough for them to have a decent running game. The zone scheme will help with that as well. The outside zone scheme is designed to have offensive lines play better than what their actual talent is because they work more as a unit and are not going to be expected or asked to block one-on-ones and win those battles. You get teamwork into one it's a zone, so it's an area. You get teamwork into an area, which is going to help that offensive line. Now, they're still not going to be great, but because of the offense they're going to be playing, because of the three-receiver base that they're going to be playing, Joe Mixon may have a similar situation to Todd Gurley has had for the past few seasons, which is he may be able to see a lot less eight-man fronts than a normal running back would see. And if you give Joe Mixon less people in the box with his talent and his ability to catch the ball and run the ball, he's going to have a good season. So that, to me, is the biggest factor of why this entire offense works so well with the scheme coming in with Zach Taylor. And I like everybody where they're going. Right now, A.J. Green to me is a steal. This is a guy, whether you're in 10, 12-man leagues, whether you're in standard or PPR leagues, he is going in the third, fourth round. Absolute steal. Because if he's healthy, he's a wide receiver one. And I get it. He's been injured. He's been banged up. And that's why he's a little bit lower. And I'm fine with that. But there's no reason he should be any lower than the early third round. I mean, this is a guy late. I'm telling you, late third round, fourth round. And not necessarily early fourth round, fourth round in a lot of platforms right now. That's where he keeps continues to go in mock drafts, in ADP work. AJ Green's an absolute steal there. Remember last year before he got hurt, he was a top five wide receiver. He still has that ability. He is still 6'4. He is still explosive. He still has great veteran savvy and he's got great hands. He is a number one wide receiver. Now, is he a guy, if you take him, you have to say to yourself, You're probably going to get hurt for three to four games. Yeah, you're going to have to have that mindset. That way you know how you want to draft later on and make sure you protect yourself for sure. But to just shy away from A.J. Green altogether, to have him be going behind the Amari Coopers of the world, going behind the Adam Thielens of the world, the Stephon Diggs of the world, no, not in this offense, not with this opportunity. I'm taking A.J. Green ahead of those guys. He's at the latest an early third round pick in my book. He's going to be a wide receiver one. And even if he only plays 12 games this season, because he will probably be in the top 10 of wide receivers all 12 of those games, I'll still take my chances and just make sure that I have backup plans in case he goes down in a crucial moment. But I'm taking that. I love me some A.J. Green this year. And there's really no reason why you can't expect great things from him. Joe Mixon's going where he should go, early second, late first, depending on what the situation is. Andy Dalton's a top streaming quarterback for me. He really is. I've never been an Andy Dalton fan. I don't think he's a great NFL quarterback. I don't think he's a guy who's really going to ever be able to win you the big game. But with this offense and this situation, and don't forget that they have a defense that's going to be awful, so they're going to have to be coming back in a lot of games and throwing the ball quite a bit in the second half. He sets up as a streaming quarterback option in the fantasy leagues. He even sets up as a guy to me that if you want to just totally say the hell with the quarterback position and just take one in like the 15th, 16th round, whatever the last round is, your draft and say, I'm just going to stream guys. I'm just going to take one. I'm good with you just taking Andy Dalton and seeing what happens. He's going to have that kind of potential where he might be able to get you borderline QB one numbers given the offense in enough weeks to make him a guy that you can play on a pretty consistent basis. It's not going to be an every week situation. It's not going to be a matchup proof situation, but on a pretty consistent week to week basis, he is a guy who's going to offer you a decent floor with some upside because of the offense, because of his throwing ability, because of his weapons. So I like Andy Dalton this year. I never thought I'd say that. You got just at the end of the day, you got to stay away from the tight ends. Third, you can, You can add Tyler Eifert to your watch list if you want. That's up to you. But this is a guy who I don't think he's going to get a ton of yards even if he's on the field. I don't know what he has left. You're hoping for touchdowns out of him. 
And he's only going to be able to get you touchdowns if he can prove to stay healthy for more than five games. And that's something that, frankly, I don't know if that's possible. But the Cincinnati Bengals overall might be a pretty good fantasy outlook for a lot of players this season. More so than you would think on a team that will probably end up being an under 500 team. But for fantasy purposes, are going to have a lot of attention. That's going to wrap up the Cincinnati Bengals. We're going to take a quick break. Come back on the other side with the Seattle Seahawks. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is proud to become a new member of Overtime Heroics. Overtime Heroics is a fantastic sports media platform for sports fans all around the world to come and participate in their extensive forums. And now with the merger of the Land Sports Network, the website will soon have great content available from extremely well-written articles to entertaining and informative podcasts from all sports for you to enjoy. All you have to do is register for free at OvertimeHeroics.com to participate. Again, that's OvertimeHeroics.com. The Seattle Seahawks are really twofold this season when we're talking about them from a fantasy outlook with their roster. And what I mean by saying that they're twofold this season is that they have the old reliable fantasy guys you're going to go to. And then they have, of course, what's been the sexy, debated conversation throughout the offseason. And that is what's happening with their wide receiver core. Let's start off with the basics. Let's start off with Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson is going to be a good quarterback. We know this. Russell Wilson is going to be a quarterback who probably will finish as a QB1 by the end of the year in the top 12, 10, the top 12 of guys. And there's a good chance that he might finish within the top eight, giving his rushing abilities as well. We also know that Russell Wilson is going to suck in September. And it, everyone seems to have amnesia and run into this problem every single year. They draft Russell Wilson. It's usually debated upon where he where he belongs, where he's valued at. You have people who hate him and won't take him. You have other people who are really going to take the shot on him. And then usually the people who hate him are laughing in the guy's face who took him in their estimation too early because he had a lousy September. He's going to have a lousy September. That's what he does every single year. He does not start the season well. For the first four games, it would not be a bad idea to have another quarterback that you liked for the beginning part of the season and played him over Russell Wilson and then waited. Because it's gotten to the point now where it's every single year, you can't ignore it anymore. It's not something that's hypothetical. It's not something like, well, it can improve this year. Like No, it's happened every year now where he started very slow in September. Picks it up as the season goes. A little bit better in October. Pretty good in November. Really good in December during the fantasy playoffs. This is why he's on so many winning teams at the end of the year because he picks it up in the moments that you need him most. Now having said all that, this is going to be a run first team just like it was last year. It's going to be another ton to the running backs. But Russell Wilson, even with a lot less opportunities, was still able to throw for 30 touchdowns last season. I don't see why it doesn't continue. It's not like he's lost anybody important. Doug Baldwin was barely on the field last year, and even when he was, it wasn't the go-to red zone guy. Do I expect Tyler Lockett to get double-digit touchdowns again this season? No, no, I don't. But I expect him to be a more focal point of the offense. I expect him to get more targets. I expect him to get more yards. I expect him to get more receptions. I just don't expect him to get double-digit touchdowns. I expect that to take a drop. But maybe not significant. Maybe still high. Maybe he goes from his double digits to eight, seven at the least. But Russell Wilson can still get his touchdowns. Why? Because David Moore, I think, will take a step up. I think he's a decent wide receiver. I think he's a good red zone target. DK Metcalf will be a big play guy. He will be a red zone target as well. Right now, the talk is the three starting receivers for the Seattle Seahawks as of this moment, looking ahead to week one, coming from inside their camp. I want to stress all those things are Tyler Lockett, David Moore, and Jaron Brown are the three starting wide receivers. That is what's being reported as of now. So that's what I need to tell you. What I'm also going to tell you is my analysis, which is by the end of training camp, there's a very good chance that instead of Jaron Brown, it's going to be DK Metcalf. I am not one of these people who thinks that DK Metcalf is just an athlete and not a football player. If you think that, clearly you didn't watch him play at Ole Miss or Mississippi State. I'm sorry. Clearly you didn't watch him play in college. 
The only thing you might have watched him was the highlights. The only thing you might have seen was his body photos. Because if you actually watched him play, he's not the most fine-tuned wide receiver. No, that's true. He needs to work on his route tree. But he runs angry. He runs with explosion. Not just deep. Not just trying to beat a guy in a foot race. But when he does go to cut, he looks to explode out of his cuts. He's a big physical wide receiver with a wide catch radius. He's good at going up and getting the ball and winning those battles. And he already is going to have an innate ability to be decent in the red zone because of his physical stature. So I have high hopes for DK Metcalf. I've said it before and I will continue to say it. I don't understand why DK Metcalf could play any different of a role than Martavius Bryant did when he first came into the league. Now, I I thought Martavius Bryant would develop into more of a complete wide receiver. We never really got a chance to see that happen because of all the -the off-the-field issues. But there's no reason why coming in, DK Metcalf can't be that big play guy. Now, I'm not saying he's going to get 1,000 yards and 8 touchdowns the way Martavius Bryant did on on the Steelers. Mostly because I don't think the, the Seahawks are going to have enough opportunities to go around the passing game for that to happen. But that role of he can be a factor on the outside every single week for the Seattle Seahawks as a guy who could take a team's off, like take a take deep end off, and the safeties are going to have to respect you and get out of the box. And that's all Seattle really needs because they want to run the ball at the end of the day. They're still going to be a run first team. So if you have a guy who demands you to take a guy out of the box on top of Tyler Lockett with that explosiveness on the other side, that's going to stretch defenses really thin when they got to play Seattle, which really helps Chris Carson and Rashad Penny. I think Chris Carson's the better running back. I've always felt that way. But it is clear to me that they are not going to have Chris Carson be in a passing role. They're not going to give him those opportunities. And that became pretty clear to me when they were willing to give Mike Davis the amount of targets and opportunities they did on passing downs after C.J. Procise went out, as they did. Now, technically speaking, C.J. Procise is back this season. And, of course, you know, Pete Carroll's already been hyping him up because that's what Pete Carroll does. C.J. Procise, at this point, has gone so long since he's been able to stay healthy for more than even... 40% of the season that I don't look at him as a huge factor going into this year to account into the running back mix, even if he is healthy early on. It's Chris Carson, it's Rashad Penny. I expect Rashad Penny to kind of eat up what Mike Davis did. Now, from all accounts, supposedly he's in better shape this season. We'll see. It was more than just I thought Rashad Penny was a fat load and an Eddie Lacy in the making that I didn't like Rashad Penny. I think he lacks explosion to the offensive line. I don't think he has the best vision. But he's a guy who can power through. He's a guy who showed some flashes in certain instances last year. And he's a guy who, for his size, is pretty decent at catching the football. And that could be the big key for him especially when you're talking about PPR leagues. He could have flex appeal in PPR leagues from week one because I do think he will be get the opportunity to catch the ball in that offense. And of course, he's probably one of the top handcuffs to have because Chris Carson can't stay healthy in his own right. You know Chris Carson's going to miss two to three games at least if, and not be banged up for a few games during as well where Rashad Penny might get a boost in touches for those weeks. So he's also a top-end handcuff. I mean, we don't even know what the extent of Chris Carson's injury is right now. They keep trying to tell us he's healthy, but you know Seattle's lied to us before. So that's something you have to keep in mind as well. At the end of the day, though, take the injuries aside, what is their actual fantasy value when they're both on the field? This is Chris Carson's backfield as far as a running back goes. He is in position to get double-digit touchdowns. He is in position to run for 1,000 yards because of how heavy this run offense is going to be. They have a better offensive line this year as well. Rashad Penny is a guy who, if Chris Carson was not to get hurt, he's a guy who could rush for six to 700 yards and tack on about three to 400 yards receiving. So have a 1,000 total yards in his own right because he will get the opportunities to do so as well. So that's what you're looking at. 
I think Chris Carson's actually being a little undervalued at the moment. Right now, whether you're in standard or PPR leagues, he's going in that like fifth, sixth round territory, low end RB two ish territory. He is a solid high end RB two if he's healthy and on the field with the opportunities that he gets and how good of a runner he is. High end RB two. Even in PPR leagues, he's a solid RB2 minimum. And when I say solid RB2, I'm talking 10, 12 man leagues. You're talking around RB16, 15, 16, 17, or somewhere in that area, that mid RB2 range. That's what you're talking about. And that's where he is, even in PPR leagues. In standard leagues, I put him closer towards the top end of the RB2s. So, for a guy who's going in the 5th and 6th round in most platforms, no matter what the scoring scoring league situation is, this is a guy you want to have. This is definitely a guy you can take and know you're going to get solid production out of. He's a steal where he's going. Rashad Penny's been climbing up a little bit here and there. 8th, ninth round. Sometimes I see him fall to the 10th, but it's, that's becoming less and less likely as we get closer to August. Ninth round, he still has the value. Even back into the 8th round, if you have a Chris Carson... Or if you're looking for a running back because you went heavy wide receiver early on, you're just looking for somebody who maybe has some low-end RB2 potential, I do think he is kind of going where he should go at the moment. Now, he shouldn't be going ahead of guys like Tevin Coleman, which he does once in a while here and there. He shouldn't be going ahead of guys like Lamar Miller. So keep that in mind. Those two guys are on the board. Make sure you're going there first. But... He's, he's in the tier right after those types of guys, which is that 8th, ninth round area. To me, personally, I'd rather have him in the 10th round, but I'm not going to argue with you if you're in the ninth round. In the 8th round, I'm going to question who is still on the board. But he's going to have value. Tight end situation for the Seattle Seahawks, I'm not touching it. I know, I know as a group... They'll perform well as a group. They're going to get touchdowns, but I'm not going to pick up Will Disley. I'm not going to play Nick Vanette. They're not going to be guys I draft. I'll keep my eye on the waiver wire. See, A, who emerges throughout training camp. You can add them to your watch list. And then, B, if one guy does emerge and he starts to get a hot hand, you know, the Seattle Seahawks tight end last year did have stretches where it was valuable because they had hot hands. Will Disley in the beginning. Ed Dixon had a little bit of a run. I don't expect Ed Dixon to really be on this team. If he is, he's going to be the third tight end behind Nick Vanette and Will Disley this season. I would expect Nick Vanette to be the starter or at least the primary pass catcher as far as the tight ends go because Will Disley is more of a blocking tight end. It was just kind of lightning in a bottle last year when he did have his little tight end one run in the beginning of the season. But at the end of the day, this is something I'm just going to I'm just going to keep my eye on it. Seattle's defense, it's also a defense where it's a, it's a streaming defense only when they play, get to play teams who are bombing on offense. They don't. It's not the same Seattle defense. This is not a defense that you're going to want to draft and feel like you have some kind of boom potential that you could possibly get out of. They're not in that situation to do that. So that pretty much wraps up the Seattle Seahawks, too. You kind of kind of know where the basics are Russell Wilson the running back game Tyler Lockett I like Tyler Lockett a lot actually before we wrap it I should talk about a little bit more about Tyler Lockett because the news with him is that he's going to be a primary slot receiver when they do go through receiver sets which I think is a great thing for him I think he oh that was always a role that he should have been in in the first place because I do think he has a better receiver tree than most give him credit for. I do think he can be more than just a big play wide receiver, which is primarily what he had been used for. He will get that opportunity now if he gets to be in the slot. I don't think he's as good as Doug Baldwin was by any stretch of the means, but if you're going to give him the extra targets, he's going to be a more consistent low-end wide receiver too with big play potential this season. And he's going about where he should go. Fifth, sixth round area. Especially in PPR leagues, I like him a bit more given the added target use, added receptions I think he could see this season. I know everyone's talking about, like, oh, he's not going to get 100 targets. Hmm. If he doesn't, no one in that Seattle offense is going to get 100 targets, I could tell you that much. And the odds are pretty good in most offenses when you have a 
competent, clear-cut number one wide receiver, he will usually get you somewhere close to 100 targets. So if Lockett doesn't get him 100 targets, nobody in the offense will. So I don't worry about that as much. Like I said, the touchdown thing, I, I don't think he's a touchdown monster unless he's getting big play after big play. So I wouldn't be surprised if that came back down to single digits, but the high end, maybe 7, 8, 9. But he's going to have more yards, more catches. He's going to be more valuable to you on a week-to-week consistent basis and not be so boomer bust this season. I could definitely see that happening. So that now that's going to wrap up the Seattle Seahawks. Now, now we hit on everybody we needed to. And on the other side here, I have a wonderful interview for you guys. I'm going to talk about the Indianapolis Colts. Take a quick break. Come right back. Get to the interview. So excited. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is proud to become the newest member of the Belly Up Sports Network. The Belly Up Sports Network is a rising star in the sports industry. After having emerged onto the scene in just a year, they have accrued a massive following with bold articles, standout podcasts, and great debate amongst followers in the forums. Sign up for their newsletter and get access to all of the information throughout the Belly Up Sports Network. Go to bellyupsports.com today to join. Be bold and stand out. Welcome back to the show, MD Nation, and I have on the line for you to break down the Indianapolis Colts in our last segment of today's episode. He is reporter, writer, radio and TV personality for ESPN 1075 and 1070 The Fan, the host of Kevin Corner's podcast. You can find him on Twitter at KBowen1070. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Kevin Bowen. What's up, Daniel? How you doing today, Kevin? I want to thank you so much for coming on today's show. I'm so excited. I know the listeners are going to be so happy to hear your takes when we're looking at the fantasy perspective of the Indianapolis Colts, continuing the fantasy analysis by Team Depth Charts series here today. But before we get into that, a lot of things I like to do uh, with guests when they come on, especially this show for the first time, so my listeners who may have never heard you before can get to know you, would be to get to know you personally a little bit more. Uh, first off, working for ESPN, that must be a great opportunity for you. And how long have you been covering the Colts for 1070 The Fan at this point? Um, it'll be two years in September. Um, I, I've covered the Colts in general since 2011. Uh, but with 1070 and 107.5 The Fan in, here in Indianapolis, um, it'll be two full years in September. I pretty much have been there you know, throughout the Andrew Luck era and then I guess a year before that. So there's a lot of fantasy intrigue, as as you know full well about the Colts this year. So happy to provide any uh, insight and, and maybe any extra tidbits that I can today. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of players for sure. Uh, what's been one of your favorite experiences since having the opportunity to cover the Colts since 2011? Well, I would say definitely going to London in 2016. You know, I, I know that there are people have varying opinions on you know a, a team in London or playing games overseas or things like that, but I thought Wembley Stadium was an unbelievable venue. Um, it was cool just to see, well, you know, fans just having such raw, raw emotion when, you know, maybe they only get a, this might be their first chance or their only chance to watch an NFL game. Um, so I definitely enjoyed that. Um, the Colts run in 2014 to the AFC title game, you know, in Andrew Luck's third year. Uh, that was pretty special as well, just to see a team that uh, maybe was a little bit ahead of schedule. And then they were humbled a bit, you know, when Luck, um, started to battle injuries in 2015, and they went through, you know, new GM, new head coach, and now here they are going into the 2019 season, and I think a lot of people um, feel like they could be a team that um, might be one of the last standing, not only in the, in the AFC, but in the NFL and in, uh, in general. Yeah, they're definitely right on the cusp there. And following up on the London, I've always wondered, because it, it does seem like there's a crazy – NFL fan base there is it's really a genuine NFL fan base or is it more like an event for them well that's a good question you know I I would say a little bit of mixing of both you know I'm not sure if the stadium that day had a bunch of diehard Colts fans in there probably a lot more just NFL fans you saw a wide variety of jerseys so that was a bit you know odd to 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 see you know all these Larry Fitzgerald and, and just random kind of jerseys throughout the stadium um, but I do think that, you know, one day if the NFL can get to maybe uh, you play eight games in Europe every year, and that means every team would play overseas uh, every two seasons and they'd give up one of their home games every four years, that to me seems like something that's a little bit more feasible than trying to plop a singular franchise over there and then 
all of a sudden they're having to play a West Coast playoff game, a wild card round against the Chargers or the 49ers or something like that. That would be really, really difficult. So um, I do think it's key for the NFL to try to tap into your global resources because that's something that the NBA does such a great job of, and I know it's a lot easier for the NBA. Uh, but I, I, I do think from an NFL standpoint, you know, trying to get a little bit more of a sustained schedule overseas would help to grow the game. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There would be such a disadvantage or advantage, uh, especially in a playoff situation, if you're flying to London or away from London. I just don't I don't think a team there would ever work. But I do like the eight game idea where every team would get a chance to play over there to really you can still drum up a good fan support in that way. Um, let's get into the football questions here for our listeners today. You know, we got to start off with the head honcho, the neck beard himself. Do you think Andrew Luck is in position to maintain or perhaps even outproduce his high numbers from last season? Yeah, I think that's maybe where you set the barometer for Andrew Luck. Um, you know, I thought the Colts running game, you know, sparked things late in, in, in the season. Um, you know, he really made big strides and probably not a lot of categories that fantasy people look towards. It was the completion percentage. It was a more efficient Andrew Luck from a passer rating standpoint. Um, the interception number came down from a, from a ratio standpoint, you know, touchdowns to INT. So, uh, you know, yards is very high. I think he was over 4,500 yards, and he threw the second most touchdowns in the NFL. I could see that touchdown number rising. You know, his career high is 40. I mean, he threw 39 last year. Him getting into the low 40s would not surprise me at all. You know, I think you've added um, some key resources to the wide receiver group and paying Devin Funches the amount of money that you paid him, and then getting a guy like Paris Campbell, who, you know, isn't a guy that, you know, needs a whole lot of, you know, low percentage touches to make chunk plays. And by that, I mean, you don't need to throw some vertical deep pass 60 yards down the field to Paris Campbell. He's a guy that can take a little dump or a swing or a screen pass and then do a lot of the heavy lifting in yards after catch. And I thought that was a big area that the Colts struggled in last season they just weren't um, one of the better teams in the NFL in making plays after the catch um, so I think you bolster your wide receiver group you bring back everyone on the offensive line the tight end position should be healthier with Jack Doyle um, back and and healthy and a Mo Alley Cox emerging as well in the second year in Frank Reich's system to me this is the time that we talk about Andrew Luck as an MVP candidate late into the month of December um, I, I, I think that's very, very possible. And if he does that, there's no reason why he shouldn't be one of the best fantasy quarterbacks in the league. No, oh, yeah. I mean, I completely agree with that. There's definitely going for an MVP race for sure. He looked so healthy last year, so back to his, his prime. And then to your point, I think this offense – second year in the offense weapons have you know have been upgraded in some senses uh, I do think the opportunity is there I think you guys might be looking at a really great season speaking on their running game which is going to be a crucial aspect of the Colts always is even with their passing game um, the coaching staff has come out and said that they expect Marlon Mack to be the featured back does that mean he will just play a significant amount all, all three downs, or will Hines still maintain a third down role? Yeah, you know, Frank Reich has mentioned that Naeem Hines is still going to be that third down back for the Colts. I think they, they, they love the hybrid nature. And I mean, he caught, I want to say he had like the third or fourth most catches of any rookie in the league last year, not even just exclusively running back. So he had a big, big role. Uh, but I think from a running back first and second down standpoint, Marlon Mack is going to be doing the heavy, heavy lifting. I mean, late in the season, he had several games of 24, 25, 26 carries um, where he was the bell cow. You know, everyone talks about running back by committee, but Marlon Mack is the definite lead feature back in Indianapolis. You know, Frank Reich really didn't use a third running back hardly at all late in the season. Jordan Wilkins, last year's starter in the season opener when Marlon Mack was hurt, he went from you know being that starting running back in week one to um, literally playing at all late in the season. So I wonder if the rival of Spencer Ware might push Frank Wright to using a third running back a little bit more. But I think for the most part, Marlon Mack is going to be that guy. If he can stay healthy, I think he'll hover right around you know, 18, 20 carries a game and 
You know, he, had, he finished last year sixth in the league in rushing yards per game, and he got pretty much all the goal line touches as well. Um, so I don't think he's going to play a whole lot in third down, and I think on the early downs he's going to be your back when you want to run the football. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's going to be the case. He has a tremendous talent, and he's a guy who, if he just gets a nice little seam, he can he can break one down the field, which makes him that much more dangerous and dynamic as well. Now, the one thing with Marlon Mack, though, is we know he is a little bit injury-prone. If he was to sustain an injury this season, you t- kind of touched on this a little bit, would it be Spencer Ware coming into the starting position, or would that would Naeem Hines get a bigger role? That's a good question. Um, I, I would probably lean towards a guy like Spencer Ware. Um, you know, I, I still don't want to rule out Jordan Wilkins either. Um, you know, I, I do think he's a guy that showed some promise, has gotten a little bigger in the off season. Um, I, I really think that'll be a decent battle. Yes, it's the third running back battle, and, and that might not mean a whole lot. But if Marlon Mack were to go down like he did last year at the start of the season, and all of a sudden Spencer Ware or Jordan Wilkins could be your starting running back. So. I think Naeem Hines more so is your third down runner. Again, use him in that kind of gadget hybrid role, uh, primarily as a receiver first. And you know, the stat that really stands out to me about Hines last year is, you know, when he was a running back, when he ran the football, he averaged less than four yards per carry. Um, I think it was like 3.7, 3.8. And Marlon Mack and Jordan Wilkins, we're both well, well above that number. And it's not like they're running behind different offensive lines or, or things like that. So I think for Naeem Hines to um, possibly take over a starting role if Marlon Mack was injured, he's going to have to show some, some, some strides in the preseason. But I tend to think in that situation, if Mack was hurt, they'd go with Ware or Wilkins. We'll watch that battle play out on, play on the preseason and keep Hines in that third down kind of specialty role. Yeah, I truly view Naeem Hines as a uh, younger, more explosive James White, uh, where he's just he's such a great pass catcher, but that's just really where you're kind of pigeonholing him to be for the most part. Uh, how much of a factor is Devin Funches going to be this season? Man, I, I think he's the number two wideout, and I, I think there's a bit of a gap between number two and number three. Um, you know, Deion Kane is, is a name that I know a lot of people – are excited to see and just how healthy he is from a, you know, coming back from a torn ACL in, in the preseason opener um, last season. And he's a guy that showed a lot in the first couple of weeks of training camp last year. But he was a guy that I think um, had a lot of talent coming out of Clemson, 20 touchdowns in three years there. But I, I still think he's got to show, just prove it in games. Didn't even barely play in a preseason game last year. And then obviously show his health as well uh, before you pencil him in as possibly challenging for number two wideout reps. So um, I look at Paris Campbell more in that slot wideout role in his rookie season. Still some questions about if he can, you know, be a, a complete route tree wideout early on in his NFL career. So I think Devin Funches, again, will be that number two wideout. And that's been a sore, sore spot for the Colts in recent years. They have swung and missed in free agency on some number two wideouts. You know, going back to Hakeem Nix, um, Andre Johnson, Kamar Aiken, uh, Ryan Grant last year, there have been some free agent signings to try and solve that number two wideout role, and they haven't worked out. So I do think that's something that they feel like Funches will come to Indianapolis and just have better resources around in in the passing game. A more accurate quarterback, more offensive-minded head coach, and Frank Reich really wanted him, and I don't think we can lose sight of that. Frank Reich kind of went to Chris Howard and said, I want Devin Funches, and Frank Reich ultimately is the guy calling plays. So um, I do think he will have a big role for this team here in 2019. Well, for Frank Reich, too, he's got to look at Devin Funches as a mini up-and-coming Alshon Jeffrey that he had where he had that red zone target on the outside. I think Devin Funches is going to be, he's going to be one of my sleeper wide receivers heading into the season when I do my rankings. Uh, I do think in that role as a wide receiver, too, and as a red zone target, a true red zone target, he, with Andrew Luck, could really have a, a nice season, possibly even a double-digit double-digit touchdown season given the explosiveness of the offense keeping in line with the wide receivers here and we touched a little bit on it is what are your realistic expectations for Paris Campbell in his rookie season 
Yeah, that's probably one of the more popular questions I, I did. And where I'm at with Funches is I'm not sure the quantity of catches and you know reps he's going to get because the Colts do have some depth of receiver. They like to play multiple tight ends a lot. And with Jack Doyle back to help, I expect that to once again be the case. But I do think when Campbell's on the field, Frank Reich is going to have him on the field for a reason, and that is to try and get one of the more one of your more dynamic playmakers the ball in space. Um, you know, people have asked me how many catches, how many touchdowns, yards. Again, that, that's I don't think it's going to be normal number three wide out maybe catches numbers, but I do think from a what he can do after the catch, you just can't ignore his explosive big play ability. And certainly if any injury happens to Hilton or Funches, this is a guy that is going to play, I think, a much, much bigger role than currently maybe he is carved out to, to, to have. But, um, you know, I think one thing that Frank Wright does such a good job of is playing to um, his skill players, especially playing to their strengths. And so I think that Paris Campbell will see the field um, again, I have Hilton and Funches as the number one and two wideouts, so I'm not sure from a quantity standpoint how many reps he's going to get, but I do feel like when he's on the field, touches are going to come his way, and now it comes down to what he can do with the football in his hands like we saw at Ohio State. Well, following up with the idea that you guys have a lot of targets to go to, a lot of that comes in the tight end position, especially in the red zone. With Eric Ebron, can he maintain his dominance in the red zone? Or is Jack Doyle back in the lineup going to take some shares there and possibly elsewhere on the field as well? Yeah, I think it's, unless you're Eric Ebron, his wife, or his agent, I don't know how you can expect him to have the same sort of season he had last year. I mean, 13 <laughs> touchdowns, it was, it was an incredible amount, and it was deserving for him to be a pro bowler. Uh, but I think he's got to become a more consistent pass catcher. I think that's the next step for him. I know a lot of his routes are a little bit deeper down the field, more vertical. It's not the underneath stuff that you typically see from a lot of tight ends. But if you dive deeper into tight end numbers around the league, his catch percentage was one of the lower ones in the NFL. Um, so I think with the added weapons you have, Doyle healthy, Funchess in the lineup, well, T.Y. Hilton only caught six touchdowns last year. I know Hilton isn't known as a big touchdown guy, but you would expect that number to maybe go up to eight or nine. And then where does that take away from Ebron's 13 number that he had last year when you expect Doyle to be a factor in the red zone? Of course, Funches comes in there as well with a 6'4", you know, 225-pound frame. So I would be surprised, honestly, if Eric Ebron was north of about 10 touchdowns this coming season. Um, and I know that hurts fancy people, but honestly, for the Colts, they would just probably rather have a more consistent guy, you know, in between the twenties, than a guy that is just so outright dominant and really is a, a bit of a one-trick pony when it comes into the red zone. Well, this is one of those great instances where it's great to talk to someone like you to be able to break that down because that's a vital piece of information as we're gearing up for fantasy drafts now that August is finally approaching. Uh, I know I'm excited for the football season. I know you must be as well. Uh, one last question for you on the Colts. Their defense was a surprise last year. Do you see them making improvements this season? And if so, where? Well, it's a really good question. It's a defense that brings back all 11 starters. Um, of course, Justin Houston will be a starter. His arrival, I think, is paramount to um, this, this unit taking strides. And they were a, a very respectable defense. Last year, I mean, I, I thought they were very respectable in what they were able to do um, in the first year under Matt Eberflus. But they're going to be playing some quarterbacks this year that are some of the best in the league. And if you look at their schedule last year, they played a very easy schedule, especially when you're talking about quarterbacks, offenses, um, you know, trying to dive a little bit deeper into, into what it looks like from a fantasy defense. I do think you'll see a bit more man coverage from them. Justin Houston, if he can be healthy and you know show some of the sack potential he had late last season, you know, this is a guy that, that you know is going to provide a dominant individual pass rusher that the Colts have really, really been missing uh, in their defense in, uh, in quite some time. So I, I think that I would probably shy away from them in fantasy just because you do play some really elite quarterbacks. 
Um, and I don't think there will be the same opportunities to take away the ball. Um, sometimes it seems like some of the quarterbacks they played last year just almost handed the football to them at, at certain times. But um, th- this, to me, I think is going to be one of the bigger storylines to watch for the Colts in 2019 is how effective can this defense be against really one of the better quarterback slates you're going to see on an opposing schedule. We're talking Rivers, Breeze, Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, in your own conference, Ben Roethlisberger. Um, you know, you, you, you're going to face, uh, I think, one of the tougher quarterback slates of any team in the NFL here in 2019. Yeah, it's one of the downfalls of actually being a good team is that you have to get the next year's schedule. You actually get to play all the uh, first-place <laughs> right, first right. teams in the following year. Um, before we close down this interview, which has been fantastic, you've given us great information. Is there anything that you're working on right now that our listeners should go check out? What's the best places to find you? And anything else that you might want to talk about? Yeah, 1075thefan.com is where all of our Colts coverage is. I, I just wrapped up a burning question series. So I looked at all nine position groups for the Colts, um, those units, and addressed three questions with with each position group. So a little bit more detail, diving into the quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, tight ends, the the, the whole nine. So uh, 1075thefan.com is where you can check that out. And if you have any other questions, um, hit me up on on, on Twitter. It's kbowen1070 on Twitter. Um, you can find me there, and I'd be more than happy to answer uh, any uh, any questions. All right, Kevin. Well, thank you so much again. You've been absolutely fantastic, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me on, Daniel. Thank you. All right, that is going to close down today's podcast. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. I think we had a lot of great content once again for you guys, a lot of good learning tidbits for you heading into August, heading into training camps. Remember, you can check out this show on your favorite pod app, Radio Public, iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker, you name it. MD's Fantasy Football Show is widely available to you. Also, make sure you're checking us out on our website, mdffshow.com. Make sure you go check out one of our great networks that we are proud members of, OvertimeHeroics.com, BellyUpSports.com, and of course our partners, the UnwrapSports.com network as well. I hope you guys all enjoyed the show. We will be back on Thursday with part six, so make sure you have everything subscribed and are following us along to know exactly when that will drop on Thursday as well. I will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show.